certain things like you said, take the doses on time, complete the course and all of that. But there are certain things that are beyond your control, which means even after you have done everything correctly, things might backfire. That happens at certain times, right? And the third one is the cost of the treatment. What do you think about this? Can you do anything about this? The cost of the treatment? If I told you that you cannot buy insurance, then can you do something to reduce the cost of the treatment or to protect yourself against very high costly treatment? With whom? Negotiate with whom? Okay, so you are saying that you can negotiate with, if I, so all these things that we are talking about here, we are assuming that buying insurance is not an option. If you had, the, if you did not have the option of buying insurance, then would you able to safeguard yourself against these possible risks, right? So here we are saying if you cannot buy insurance, then can you do something to safeguard yourself against very high cost of treatment and then somebody said that you can negotiate with the hospital based on your income level and you can say I'm a low income individual. Is that what you're saying? And say that okay I, I should get a better price on grounds of equity and fairness. But what is your bargaining power in that case? Bargaining power is they deal with you with something or if they don't get a dime from you because you don't have Then you don't get treatment either. Who is that? Huh? In ER, but let's say I'm just going to a doctor, a doctor's visit. Here I, I did not make any assumptions like ER or anything of that sort, right? But if you're truly sick, mm -hmm. like government has already installed, has laws where medical facilities, it's illegal to turn them away. Anywhere? Yes. Yeah. Dumping is illegal. It used to be legal like in the 80s and 70s, no longer legal. But what I'm trying to say is, okay, you have a disease condition, okay? Let's say you have cancer, okay? So you go to a doctor, you get some amount of treatment, you get, the, you get treated for, you know, your emergency stuff or whatever. But you need follow-up for cancer, for a disease condition like cancer, you need follow-up. If you are not paying a penny, out of your pocket and you do not have any health insurance, is it by law that you have to receive treatment throughout? I think so. I mean, it depends on what you're getting treatment for. Then if, if that is true, I have a doubt about, well, I have a doubt about that. The reason being, if that would have been true, then there would be no incentive for people to buy insurance. If I know that no matter what condition I'm in, no matter what disease I am in and no matter how long I suffer. So let's say I, am, I have a disease and I need treatment for the next 20 years of my life. Let's say it may happen to someone. I may have a disease which needs treatment for next 20 years of my life or it may need treatment for as long as I live. If I know that it is illegal for any healthcare provider to turn me away irrespective of how costly the treatment is, then there would be no need for health insurance at all. Think about that. So you're saying like if someone has diabetes and at least the beginning for the 20 years, they're not going to be able to get, just because you don't have insurance on you, they're not required to treat you the same way. Exactly. What I'm saying is, so I'm not saying that, let's say, okay, let's say a person goes into labor. Okay, a person is want, going to have a baby and the person goes into labor and does not have the money or the means to pay for hospital and ends up in emergency labor room. In that case, what you're saying is true. That person cannot be turned away. That person will be given the assistance for delivery, will be given, you know, whatever uh, uh, gynecological care and initial pediatric care and all of that will be provided. Now I'm saying that this person does not have any insurance, public or private, but needs follow-up care for herself, postnatal care. And she needs that postnatal care for the next six months, let's say, for whatever. Is she going to get treated irrespective what is the cost of her treatment? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, like so we are ruling out those emergency. I don't think that is true because if that would have been true, 
then there would be no need for insurance. Think about that. All of us would, uh, uh, because remember, we are all rational individuals. If I know that no matter what I'm suffering from and no matter what is the cost of the treatment, as long as I end up going to a doctor, that doctor is legally bound to treat me. Why would I buy insurance? So the cost of the treatment, coming back to this point, if the cost of the treatment is super high, then you really don't have any other method to insulate yourself or protect yourself except buying health insurance or having somebody else share that part of the risk, either partly or fully, right? So that means this is the risk. This is where health insurance plays a major role. Correct. Your cost of treatment, you can insulate yourself against high cost of treatment if you buy health insurance. And depending on the conditions or the terms of your health insurance, you may be fully covered or you may be partially covered for your whatever you know treatment you are undergoing, big or small, whatever be the cost of the treatment. Okay, and it would depend on the terms of the treat uh, terms of the health insurance. But coming back, so we are basically trying to say the fundamental premise is that any kind of health insurance is bought because by an individual because he wants to keep some kind of uh, protection, because he wants to buy some kind of protection against very large cost of treatment, exorbitant costs of treatment. Okay, is that clear? So that means what is an individual trying to do? An individual is trying to share, so this is from a person's point of view, from the individual or the buyer's point of view. The individual or the buyers want to share cost of treatment. And this sharing of cost is also sharing of risk because we said that this cost is a kind of risk, right? So they mean the same thing. Sharing of cost or sharing of risk, they mean the same thing. This sharing of risk of treatment with a third party. And who is this third party? The third party is the insurance company. Right. So that means now we have, if we think about this setup, this health insurance, so we started with saying health insurance. Now if we consider health insurance to be a commodity that is bought and sold in the market, that means if you're specifically talking about the market for health insurance, then the buyers want to buy health insurance because they want to share the cost or they want to share the risk of high medical costs. Right now, every buyer you know from your uh, knowledge of you know market and demand and supply in general, you know that every buyer who goes to the market to buy a commodity in his mind, he wants to pay a price for that commodity. Right. So if I walk into a store for buying a pair of jeans, in my mind, I know what is the maximum amount of money or what is the maximum price that I'm willing to pay for that pair of jeans. Now, when I go to the store, the price sticker on the jeans, on the pair of jeans, that may be lower than my willingness to pay, it may be higher than my willingness to pay, or it may be equal to my willingness to pay, correct? So let's say I want to buy a pair of jeans and I go to a store and I think to myself that, okay, I'm going to buy this pair of jeans for a maximum of 30 bucks. I'm not going to pay any more. Now, when I walk into the store, I may end up buying it for exactly 30 I may buy it for 20 or I may find that the price is higher than 30, right? If I buy it exactly for 30, then psychologically I'm not gaining anything, I'm not losing anything, psychologically. If I buy it for less than 30, then I feel happy because I feel it's a psychological gain. And if I end up buying it for more than 30, then I'm not super happy about it because I think I did not get a good deal. That happens to all of us, correct? Even in the case of insurance, that means what the buyer wants to pay for insurance, that is called his maximum willingness to pay. So every buyer has a maximum 
willingness to pay for the insurance WTP willingness to pay do you understand the concept of willingness to pay all of you it's at the psychological level okay in my psyche in my mind how much do I want to pay for this insurance and do you agree that this maximum willingness to pay will be different for individual buyers your maximum willingness will be dependent on how risky you think your health situation is or how high your health care cost will be can be your willingness to pay on is based on that and her willingness to pay will be different from that because she knows her health condition and she knows how much potential cost of treatment she can have in the future in that way each one of us individual buyers of health insurance we will have different maximum willingness to pay correct now from the insurance companies so from so from this part it looks kind of a good situation for the buyers that okay we have some risk of treatment and that risk comes from the fact that the cost of the treatment can be extremely high so we want to insulate ourselves against that risk and hence we end up buying insurance and when we go to buy insurance we have a maximum willingness to pay sometimes we may end up buying the insurance for exactly that willingness to pay sometimes the price may be lower than the willingness to pay and sometimes the price may be higher than the willingness to pay so it's a great situation for the buyers that I'm able to share the risk now if I give you only this information then the next question that arises that this seems to be a great situation for the buyers and why what about the sellers what are the sellers getting from this because from here it looks like okay buyers are pushing some amount of the cost and some amount of the risk on the insurance company that is the seller so the insurance company is the seller here right they are the ones who is selling insurance so from the seller's perspective what they what do they have to look forward to because here everything is for the buyer I have risk and I want to push the risk onto somebody else and I have a willingness to pay and I adjust my willingness to pay and hence end up buying the insurance what is there for the sellers to look forward to that means there must be also something that the sellers gain out of this right so the sellers or the insurance companies while the buyers want to share the risk the sellers want to assume that shared risk or accept that risk they assume the risk and they have a minimum willingness to accept for that risk so once again just like the seller of a pair of jeans you want to buy it for twenty dollars but the seller knows in his mind the store that you walk into they know that how much they are willing to sell that for and please note that the minimum willingness to accept may be less than what is the sticker price of the jeans right isn't it that is why some sellers are able to provide you discounts during certain festival seasons for the same commodity that means their minimum willingness to accept may be sometimes lower than what is the sticker price of the commodity you have a pair of jeans which is twenty dollars you walk into the store and you buy it for twenty dollars does not necessarily mean that the seller cannot lower the price any further because you know that price includes whatever markup the seller wants to keep on the commodity right because he wants to make a profit that same jeans during Christmas sale the seller could be selling for ten bucks right that means his minimum willingness to accept was not that 20 originally but it was lower than 20 that's why he has been able to slash the price otherwise he would never be able to slash the price isn't it correct so that means the seller of the insurance company is willing to take this risk but he is willing to take this risk for a price which is higher or at least equal to his minimum willingness to accept do you agree he is willing to take this risk but then he will take that risk only by charging a price for the insurance which is at least equal to his willingness to accept minimum willingness to accept or higher than his minimum willingness to accept is that clear okay 
and what is he going to do with this risk so this is a this is so the buyer has transferred the risk onto the seller but how what does the seller do with all that risk now it is becoming risky for the seller so it's a risky proposition to kind of you know take the responsibility of so many people with different health conditions what do you think the seller is going to do to kind of minimize his risk what will the insurance company do so they so while these people are going to share the risk these people are going to pool the risk risk pooling and what do i mean by risk pooling risk pooling is basically spreading of risk across a large pool of individuals okay so they are going to manage the risk that they have taken up by spreading that risk across a large group of individuals so they are going to bunch people by certain categories and those categories could be by disease conditions or the the category could be by age or the category could be by gender and they are going to price these different categories differently right for example you know in ca case of life insurance usually if you go to buy a life insurance usually the males have a higher price of insurance than the females for females the price is lower but the males it is higher so that means the insurance company thinks that the males in terms of you know their life the males are riskier and why do you think they think in that way because you know in united states the life expectancy of the males are lower so that means the insurance company thinks that the males are have a higher probability of dying early so if you are selling insurance to them for their life it is worthy to sell them at a higher price than the females but is it true that all males that they sell the insurance to are going to die before females is it true that all men die before their wives or partners female partners that's not true right but it's a general perception of the insurance company based on certain empirical facts that is the life expectancy of the males in united states in general is lower and hence they expect that men will die earlier and so they think that we should charge a higher price for the males but when you have that large pool of males some people will die early some people will live long and die late so what is happening the risk is getting spread out among those large group of male individuals similarly for health insurance people think that okay if you age as you get older then you know you become sicker and you are more likely to fall fall sick and use health care and your treatment costs are going to be higher correct so insurance companies health insurance companies would usually charge a higher price to the elderly people than the younger people if you go to buy health insurance your premium is likely to be less than a person who is older than you that is how they price it but is it true that all elderly people will have high health care costs it is not true right it may or may not be true there might be lot of elderly individuals who do not have significantly high health care cost while there may be lot of younger individuals who have consistent health care cost consistently high health care cost so what are they doing they are pooling the individuals based on some empirical fact but then they are trying to spread that risk over the large pool of individuals or in other words what i'm trying to say is that in that pool of individuals who are similar in certain characteristics and that similarity could be in age similarity could be in gender similarity could be on the basis of a health condition some of the individuals would be high risk individuals and some of the individuals would be low risk individuals and some individuals would be moderate risk individuals but if the insurance company is making all those individuals pay the same price 
then they are basically spreading the risk across that pool. Is that clear? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So that is the gain or that is what the insurance companies are trying to capitalize. That is the source of profit or that is the incentive for the insurance companies to sell health insurance. Had this been not there, had the prospect of risk pooling not been there, then it would not make sense for any insurance company to sell insurance. Because then it would only be a bright situation for the buyers. There is nothing to look forward to for the sellers. Correct? Okay. Is that clear? Any questions? Are we all on the same page? Okay. So that means now you have the buyers, that is the individuals who want to share the risk, and there is sellers, the insurance companies who are pooling the risk. Now only when there is an agreement or equality between this maximum willingness to pay and that minimum willingness to accept, that is when the transaction takes place or the buying and the selling of insurance take place, right? So the individuals may th must think, the buyers must think that, okay, whatever is my willingness to pay, this matches with the insurance company's willingness to accept, and hence they decide on a certain market price, correct, and end up buying and selling the insurance, okay? So coming back, so we said that people can buy only when, you know, kind of there's an agreement between the two sides, between the seller's side and the buyer's side, but primarily risk aversion is the reason why it's being bought, right? People want to avert risk. It's the risk averse behavior of the people that is forcing them or that is kind of triggering the buying of health insurance. And people usually want to buy insurance, people end up buying health insurance, and I'm just writing HI. People want to buy health insurance when there is possibility of high cost <coughs> okay so what am i trying to say i am saying that it is people want to avert risk now this risk we said is the cost of the treatment and the cost of the treatment could be high or it could be low right but usually a high cost of treatment happens with a very low probability that means what am i trying to say i'm saying okay fine you have in your in during the course of your life or let's say you consider 10 years of your life the next 10 years of your life what is the probability that you will spend 20 dollars on your health very high Right? In the next 10 years of your life, the probability that you will spend at least $20 every year on your health is super high. You go for some you know, vaccination, you'll end up spending more. You go for some dental cleaning, your out-of-pocket will be more than $20. So the probability of a low-cost treatment is going to be extremely high. But what is the probability that you are going to have a medical bill of $1,000 in the next 10 years? $100,000, not $1,000, sorry, $100,000, it's low. It's not zero, but it is tending towards zero for many of us, correct? So, so always when the cost of the treatment is high, that cost of treatment being high happens with a low probability in the life of most individuals. But the cost of treatment being low happens with a very high probability in the life of most individuals. So there is an inverse relationship between the cost of the treatment and the probability of causation. Can you please write that down? There is an inverse relationship. There is an inverse relationship between cost of treatment and 
probability of causation. So, that means high cost implies low probability and low cost implies high probability. So, there is an inverse relationship. And please note that buyers are not worried about the low cost, they are worried about the high cost. But the probability of that high cost is extremely low, very low. So, that means people do not care how rare that event may be in their life, but what they care about is how much is likely to go out of their pocket even if that adverse event happens with very insignificantly low probability. Do you see what I am trying to say? That means people are extremely scared just where Brad, right? Your name is Brad, isn't is it? Brad, where just where Brad started by saying why do people want to buy insurance? Because they want to minimize their out of pocket payment. They want to pay less. So, that means this cost, the actual dollars, that is a much bigger thing, it is a bigger factor for all individuals, all buyers than whatever probability is attached to that event. Probability may be extremely low. And this is also something, please note that this is exactly what the insurance company capitalizes on. The probability is low. So, what are the chances that people in that pool of individuals, whatever pool they are trying to create, how many people are going to have that high cost treatment? Maybe 1 out of 10 or 2 out of 10. The others are not going to have that because the probability is low. So, the insurance company tries to gauge how low the probability is, correct, while the buyers try to gauge how high that cost could be. So, the buyers set their willingness to pay based on how high that cost can be, right? Whereas, the insurance companies try to set their willingness to accept based on how low that probability could be. Am I making sense? Those are two aspects of it, right? Now, the next part moving on. So, now we are saying, okay, so these guys, one person looks at the actual dollars, that is the buyer trying to gauge that how much will I actually spend out of my pocket in the next 10 years on my health, while the insurance company who is selling him talks to him like Josh said, questions the person probably and tries to gauge what is the probability of this person having some exorbitantly high health care expenditure in the next 10 years of his life. Okay, and then they try to match this willingness to pay and willingness to accept and set the price of the insurance, where the price of the insurance is the premium. It is called premium. Whatever the insurance companies charge from the buyers, whatever the buyer has to pay to the insurance company to get that insurance. Okay? So, the next topic here is setting of the premium. How do they set the market price? What is the time, guys? Huh? 4.22. I am always behind time. Okay, setting the premium. Next part is how do insurance companies set the price of the insurance? Now, this premium is usually based on expected payout. And I will tell you what is expected payout. And this expected payout is usually denoted by the capital letter E. Expected payout is denoted by the capital letter E. Expected payout is the average, is the average payout for an individual in the pool that is created by the insurance company. So, it is the average payment made made by the insurance company in 
the pool. Okay? And once again, just reminding you that that pool might have high risk individuals, low risk individuals and moderate risk individuals. Okay? But whatever the insurance company is paying out on an average for an individual in that pool, that is what helps them to set the expected payout and based on the expected payout, they set the premium. Okay? So let's say I have a pool of individuals which has more high risk people and less low risk people. Then what will happen? Will the premium be high? Yes. If I have more low risk people, then obviously the premium will be less because the expected payout will be less. Now to answer the question that Tyler, right? Tyson. Tyson was asking that why don't we consider a pool that is nationwide? Why don't we consider something that is large enough? Now for something like health, Tyson, it is so difficult to gauge who is high risk and who is low risk. And if you have a pool as large as, you know, this entire economy, it will become even more difficult to gauge what this is, what the expected payout is. So it is not easy for the insurance company to gauge that expected payout. Do you see what I am saying? Now, so the premium is not just based on the expected payout, it is just one aspect and the most important aspect. The second aspect is administrative costs because you know every private company has some cost of running, fixed cost and variable cost that we were talking about, hiring of workers, paying for office space and all of that. Some fixed costs, some variable costs, so there is administrative cost, okay some reserve funds what are reserve funds what if my business runs into problems tomorrow so i want to keep some safety money or contingency fund for my business so if i'm an insurance company tomorrow suddenly my business may go into loss i still have to pay for the fixed cost if i'm not shutting down my business i still have to pay for the office space i still have to pay the electricity bill for my office so i have to have some contingency money for covering my fixed costs that is what i mean by reserve funds and most importantly of course after all of this i want to have a markup because i want to have some profit so i will price the commodity that i'm selling i will price the health insurance in such a way that i have certain percentage of profit Correct? So that means the health insurance company sets the price of the insurance, that is this premium, based on capital E, which is expected payout, which is the most important thing, some administrative costs, some reserve funds, and then the next most important thing, that is the profit. Correct? So E plus all those three things will be the premium. So that means you can understand that in most cases, and most usually what will happen is this premium is going to be higher than capital E, isn't it? Do you agree that this premium which is set by the insurance company is going to be greater than capital E because capital E is just one part of the premium. Premium is E plus these three things. So obviously the premium will be greater, right? Now, the difference between this premium and this expected pay payout, so premium minus E, which is going to be a positive number usually, is called the loading fee or the load of insurance. Loading fee or load. So that means this loading fee, and this is denoted by capital L. So capital L is the loading fee. So now you have three things here. You have a premium, which is basically the market price of the insurance. It is the actual dollar that goes out of your pocket into the pocket of the insurance company. Then there is a capital E, which is basically what the insurance company expects to pay for an average individual, on an average for an individual in the pool. So that means this is the cost or this is what the insurance company is actually expecting to pay for assuming the risk 
right? That is what the insurance company is actually, yes, Casey. No, no, no. Okay, it is E plus. Okay. Just want to make sure. So e is only this. Number one is only E. So when you're saying premium created with E, you're not including those four. No. Premium includes all four. Premium is based on all four. Premium will be set okay. such that it includes all four. Okay. But E is only the expected payout. Okay. Now coming back, what I'm trying to say is this is what the buyer is paying. This is the actual dollar that is paid by the buyer and going into the pocket of the seller or the insurance company. What is the E? The E is what the insurance company expects. It's an expectation. It's not actual. It's an expectation of what the insurance company thinks that it will pay for an individual on an average in that pool that it has created. So that means this is the insurance company's best guess about what will be the cost of risk sharing of these group of buyers, this pool of buyers. Do you agree? Is there a problem with that, that way of explaining E? It is the insurance company's best guess. It is the insurance company's best, you know, uh, estimation of how much it will spend for one individual in that pool that it has created, right? So that means this is also called, based on that explanation, this capital E or the expected payout, this is also called the fair value of insurance. Fair value of insurance. And why is it called the fair value? It's called the fair value because, see, the buyer wanted to transfer only that risk, right? And the insurance company wants to assume that risk. And this E is nothing but the cost of that risk sharing and that risk assuming by the insurance company. All these things have nothing to do with the risk, right? That's just operation cost and that's profit motive of the company. That has got to do with his business side. It has got nothing to do with the risk side. Do you see what I'm saying? The profit, the reserve fund, and the administrative costs, those are operational costs, and those are true for any business. It is not just for an insurance company. If I'm selling ice creams, I have administrative costs, I have reserve funds, and I will want to make profit. But the only thing that sells, sets an insurance seller apart from any other business is what is the price that he wants to charge or what part of the price is he charging for taking over that risk. And it is this price. And it is exactly this part that the buyer wants to transfer onto him. That is the risk part, okay? That's why this is called the fair value of the insurance. Is that clear? So that means the difference between these two the premium and the fair value, that means which is basically number two, three, and four, that should be the difference. That is actually the price of the insurance. So E is basically the price of the risk. And the price of the commodity actually is that loading fee. Do you see what I'm trying to say? This might get a little confusing. Okay, now the expected payout is only the part which is based on the estimation or the assessment of the risk by the individual, uh, by the insurance company for an individual in the group that it has created, in the pool that it has created, okay? So it is basically the price that is attached to the risk, the same risk that you want to share and the same risk that the insurance company wants to assume, okay? So that is the fair value of the insurance. The difference between these two, that means, are the operational costs, which is the profit, the reserve funds, and, you know, the administrative cost. And we are calling that the loading fee. So that means loading fee is basically 2, 3, and 4. And that 2, 3, and 4 is actually the price of the commodity. The price of the commodity after excluding the price of the risk. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes? Okay. Now, usually that loading fee 
is expressed as a percentage and you will not have any numerical problems for calculating the loading fee but just giving you the formula that usually the loading fee you have to understand the concept for you that is just enough but usually this loading fee is calculated by premium divided by the expected payout or the fair value minus 1 times 100 so it's expressed as a percentage okay so it's basically the percentage based on the ratio of the premium with the expected value and you don't have to think too much about that formula because you will not have any numbers or you will not have any uh, numerical problems to do on that now yes Yes, there are two different equations. Correct, because this would just mean that I am expressing it as a ratio. This would mean premium, this, this is the same as premium minus E divided by E times 100. So it is still premium minus E, but I am expressing it as a ratio of the real E. So it's just expressed as a percentage of the ratio. So that's why I'm saying you don't need to worry about this part. I'm just showing you that this is the formula that most textbooks would show and the notes that I'm going to give you will also show that formula so that you don't get confused. For you, it is enough to understand this. Okay, But it means the same thing conceptually, just another way of expressing it. It's a percentage of the ratio. Okay. Now the next part is now how do they, so what are the ways, that means there must be an important, there must be some way in which the insurance company can estimate or best guess this expected payout, right? There must be some way that the insurance company is able to calculate that. There are two ways of doing that. One is called the experience rating. And the other one is called community rating. So some insurance companies will follow experience rating. Some insurance companies will follow community rating. Those are just two methods of best guessing the expected payout for a large group of individuals for a pool that they have created. Experience rating, as the very name suggests, it's just based on experience. So they will just have a pool of individuals and they will see that if there was a similar pool of individuals in the past, then what was the payout for that pool of individuals? And to know those past experiences, they will have several questions based on pre-existing conditions, on the gender, on the age, and things like that. Lifestyle, are you a smoker, are you a drinker? If you smoke, how many cigarettes do you smoke? If you uh, drink, how many times do you drink during the week? and so on and so forth, all of that information. So based on the experiences, okay, that is just experience rating, that is how they will get to capital E. And community rating is where they treat all individuals as equal. So if you are a 60 year old person, you fall in the pool of 60 year olds and since you are 60 year old, I consider your E to be something. That is community rating. Or if you are a female, I have created a pool of females and no matter what your health condition is, just by being a female, no matter what kind of lifestyle you lead, I consider you to have a certain E. Okay. So what am I trying to say? Here, the experience rating could be a pool of individuals, males and females, but it is more uh, narrow in the sense that it goes by the experiences of the individuals in his or her individual life. And based on that, they try to calculate E. Whereas this is a more broader measure where they just categorize based on some broad factors like gender or age and consider everybody in that category to have exactly the same risk and hence the same capital E. Is that clear? <laughs> 